Sessions at the Art Workhouse is a monthly broadcast event. Notable guests from various industries join us on the Art Workhouse Discord server to talk about any topic they believe will be the most useful for artists who are working on improving their career or craft. To find out more about the Art Workhouse and to catch the sessions live, head on over to artworkhouse.org, where you'll be able to join our lively, moderated community. This month, we'll be chatting with Dorian Eaton, an illustrator and teacher best known for his mastery of light and shadow. He's going to spend some time with us to talk about how to use realistic light and shadow to bring your illustrations alive, walking us through some of the tips and techniques he's learned throughout his artistic journey and 10 plus years of teaching. There's more information about him at the start of the episode, and this was among the most instructive sessions we've ever hosted. There's a lot to dig into, so grab a notebook and let's jump right into the session. Perfect. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're going to be chatting today with um, Dorian Eaton. Uh, I'm sure you guys had a good look at the event card, but just as a refresher, he's studied at the Angel Academy of Art in Florence. Uh, he also studied entertainment design at the art department in the U.S., and he's been teaching like academic art, illustration, entertainment design for more than 10 years. Um, I know a lot of you probably know him from the Proco YouTube channel, actually, which is where I first encountered uh, your work, Dorian. So I know you've been featured there on like a video and on a couple live streams, and we're just super stoked to have you here. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. I was excited to be here. So I know you are doing this as an audio podcast, typically, but Discord allows me to share my screen and Spotify now supports video podcasts. So what I'm going to do is give a lecture that consists of about 400 slides. So you might want to turn on the video aspect of this. If you have a bigger device, that's better, like a tablet or a desktop or laptop computer. Otherwise, if you only have a phone, that should be fine too. And Grant, is there anything else you wanted to say? I think that's it. The floor is yours, my guy. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll talk about seeing more today. Here's a photograph of me working on a charcoal drawing way back, about 15 years ago, uh, at Angel Academy. And I've been on this like love affair with going deep uh, into art. And I'm convinced that the more you are able to see and perceive in the world around you, the more you're able to put into your artwork. And by more, I mean visual information, but also nuance and subtlety and richness and complexity. And that will make your work more fun to look at. It will make it more impactful, more powerful. And you as the creator have more uh, like instruments in your orchestra. You can make more deliberate decisions. So we'll talk about light and shadow today. And hopefully the next hour or so will expand your sensitivity and you'll start noticing uh, things in the world around you that so far you haven't seen. You've missed them. And maybe this will even change how you have conversations with people because instead of getting angry with them, you will be looking at the shadow in their nose and geeking out over the reflected light and all of that stuff. So this is what the studio looked like in the classical atelier school. Some of you will be familiar with this type of training. There's a sculpture here in the middle and then two working spaces. My space was on the left here and we were drawing this hand in charcoal. And this is my finished drawing that I framed rather poorly. Um, but if you look at the drawing, it doesn't look like a drawing. It doesn't even look like a photograph. It looks almost like a hologram or like a three-dimensional sculpture. And for me, that's so fun. And those final stages of, of really, it's more like sculpting and drawing. And even today, when I look at this drawing inside my parents' house, it has, like, it's just solid. And there's something like i feel proud of having done this but it's also a really really good experience as an artist 
to push a work as far as you can pos possibly push it. And just for context, I took three months to do this drawing, spending three to four hours a day, five days a week. So it's a serious project. And I had a very good teacher by my side, Jared Wozniki, who has an incredible eye. And if you take two images like this, on the left, like these are both drawings of hands. On the left is a very simple, rough drawing. There is not much complexity of information, not much richness and depth. On the right, there's as much richness and depth and, and resolution as I could muster. And you can think of this as a range or a scale from kind of very low, uh, like close to 0%. Zero 0% percent. Zero percent complexity would be a white piece of paper, I guess. And on the, on the right is high complexity. Seeing a little, putting little into the work on the left, and seeing a lot and putting a lot into the work on the right. Of course, my drawing is not the limit. It's somewhere on the higher end, but you can go way beyond that. Like I didn't use a looking glass, for example, like a magnifying glass. And, you know, you could. There are people who draw with magnifying glasses. But most artists and most beginners, for sure, live and create their work kind of in this limited range over here. Their most complex, most rich, most alive work stops on the pretty low end of the scale. And I think it serves you very well to push that range, to expand that range for all the reasons I mentioned at the beginning. So I'll give you an overview of 12 light effects. They're also called modeling factors. And then we'll dive quite deeply into each one of these. So we'll start with separating light and shadow. And by the way, this information is from my course, my online course called the shading course. And I'm giving you kind of a, a condensed version of the first two modules of the course that I hope will be very useful for you. So if we look at the moon, it has clearly a lit side and it has a shadow side, but we can't really see it because it merges with the blackness of space. And if we look at the head, it has a light side and it has a shadow side. There's a clear, almost like a country border between the lit side and the shadow side, or the country of light and the country of shadow. That border is called a terminator in astronomy and also increasingly in drawing instruction, thanks to people like James Gurney and myself who are using that, that term because I think it's the most precise uh, word to use for that country border. If we change the camera direction here to move the camera so we are looking from the same direction from which the light is shining right now, you can see that there is no more shadow. We can't see the shadow side. It's still there, but it's on the other side of the head. So you can say that the terminator is the boundary of the area of the object that the light sees in quotes. I go back, what the light sees is illuminated. What the light can't see is past the terminator in the shadow side. You see that on this drawing as well. There are these boundaries throughout the drawing separating light and shadow. And I'm sure you've come across that rule in art instruction, separate your lights and your shadows. It is important. So we can divide any subject into the light family and the shadow family. In the light family, there is what I call the form light. So that's part of the object, whether that's a portrait or a figure drawing or a still life object, whatever you're drawing. If it's part of that object and it's receiving direct light, that is form light. And then of course there's form shadow. So the shadow side of the moon, for example shadow 
And between those two is that country border called the Terminator. Then on the floor, there's also the cast shadow. And there's the first fascinating thing that the Terminator actually creates the cast shadow. It's the Terminator shape that is being projected down onto the floor here, creating the cast shadow shape. So this is the highest level um, organization of light on form for me, in my mind, the way I've come to think about it in the last 15 years or so. But now we can subdivide these four elements further. There is reflected light. I'll give, I'll run through them now and then go deeper into each one. The reflected light, core shadow. You've, you've probably heard most of these terms before, but some will be new, I think. The so core shadow, then halftones, the highlight or specular reflection, center light, ambient light, ambient occlusion, and finally, the penumbra. All right, let's go deeper. Now, starting with the reflected light. There are three things that are really important here. Distance, color, and angle are what drive how reflected light looks. So here is a cylinder on a black piece of paper. If I replace that black piece of paper with a green piece of paper, you can see that the form shadow here highlighted changes how it looks completely. It's getting much brighter and it's getting green because the light that's bouncing off of the floor is bouncing back into the cylinder. Similarly, on a sculpture like this, and again, that's a charcoal drawing. This time I spent four months on that drawing. Uh, here's a side view of it. There's direct light coming in from the lamp and that light is bouncing back. And some of it is bouncing from the chest, for example, back into the chin. And you can see that in the drawing right here. This is the effect of reflected light. Or on this cube, if we remove the floor, you can see that the shadow side here is completely black, like the shadow of the moon because it's not receiving direct light, it's past the terminator. So the only way to illuminate that shadow side is through reflected light, the light hitting the floor and bouncing back into the shadow. We go to the side view here and visualize light rays that are coming in and hitting the floor. We will ultimately end on this shadow side here. So, in, in reality, there are probably an infinite or near infinite amount of light rays or photons hitting the scene, hitting the floor, hitting the box. To simplify, I've reduced it to four light rays here. And wherever a light ray is hitting a surface, it will reflect off. And it will reflect in a diffused way. So light rays shooting in all kinds of directions. Unless you have a mirror, with a mirror, the light is coming in and then reflecting at the same angle. But any other material like skin or wood or plastic or concrete, the reflected light is bouncing back in all directions. So if we focus on this ray, some of its reflected light will hit the shadow plane of our cube here. When it hits that side of the cube, it is reflecting again in a diffuse way. So it's bouncing once and then bouncing twice. Some of that reflected light will hit our cast shadow. So the only way that this cast shadow is not black is because a light ray is traveling all the way from the sun or the light source, hitting the floor, hitting the side of the cube, and then finally making its way down to the cast shadow area. So again, the same thing, light coming in hitting the floor, bouncing into the shadow, uh, form shadow of the cube and bouncing again into the cast shadow. I've marked the tonal value at each bounce. You can see in the top right here how the value is getting darker every time. That's because 
each time light is reflected off of a surface, it loses most of its energy, not just a small part, but most of its energy. So where we have a quite bright, like light gray tone on the floor, that's direct light hitting there. And then by the time the reflected light makes its way to the shadow side of the cube here, it is much darker. And then again, it's bouncing, making its way to the cast shadow, and it's much darker still. With every bounce, it loses a lot of energy. If we think of light family and shadow family, there is form light on the cube here, and in a way also form light on the floor. That's direct light hitting the floor. And then we got form shadow on the cube and cast shadow from the cube on the floor. Here is a, another box. Let's look at the shadow side here. I'm going to bring in a reflector, a white piece of wood panel. You see, if I go back, watch the shadow side here, go back one step, no reflected light. And I bring in a reflector, and it's quite far away, but still. Like already we get brightening of the shadow there. Now I'm going to bring that plane closer, see how the reflected light gets stronger and closer still. Now it's super strong. Closer still. So really strong reflected light. I think that's about the maximum you can get. A white surface, light shining on it, and it's bouncing back all that reflected light into the shadow of our tall cube there. Now watch what happens if I keep the same distance, but I change the value, the tonal value of the reflector. So instead of a white reflector, we're going to have a black reflector. And you can see that this pretty much kills all the reflected light. So the darker your surface is that's receiving light, the less reflected light they will send back. You have a brighter surface, it will send back or reflect a lot of light. Here's a green uh, paper, and you can see that wherever reflected light is reaching, we get that green influence. And notice that it's mostly in the form shadow, not so much in the cast shadow, and definitely not in the direct light, the form light here. Finally, angle. So here we are kind of at a 90 degree angle and I'm going to tilt this plane and with every with increased tilt the reflected light gets weaker and weaker so that being said on round surfaces we get this dark band of tone the core shadow and that is because the the direct light here that's hitting the floor and bouncing back is reaching the sphere at different moments of the sphere turning away. You can see it with these arrows here. So towards the bottom, the surface of the sphere is pointing towards the floor. So it's more receptive for the reflected light. But as it turns up, it rotates away from the floor. So the angle changes and the reflected light has a weaker influence. In addition to that, the distance is a factor too. So the further the reflected light has to travel, the more energy it loses as well. So the only reason why we have this darker tone, which is the core shadow, is because there is reflected light and we have a curved surface. Important here, the core shadow is within the form shadow area, right? That's after the terminator. A lot of people confuse or conflate the terminator with the cast with the core shadow, but they're not the same thing. The terminator is the country border between form light and form shadow, and the core shadow is the part of the form shadow that's not been lightened by reflected light. I know these are a lot of technical terms, but I hope that makes sense. The core shadow is within the form shadow. And the reflected light creates the core shadow. So 
So no reflected light on the moon, no core shadow on the moon. Let's jump into halftones. We've talked about form shadow now, or before. Now let's talk about form light. The halftones are those different tones within the form light that become darker as the, the form turns away from the light direction. Uh, Grant referred to the video on the Proco YouTube channel. There's a video of me that's called something like mind-blowing realistic shading tips, I think. And I recommend watching that. I explain the rate at which these tones change in that video. But today it's more high level overview. A lot of people call the light half tones up here, the highlight. That's even in art instruction books. And I think that's wrong. It is inaccurate. The highlight is the specular reflection. It is the reflection of the light source in your subject. Again, whether that's a figure drawing or a portrait or a car, whatever it is, the highlight is the light source itself. If we turn our sphere here into a chrome sphere, we can see that there is a lamp on a uh, mount up here above the scene. And the lamp is in the place where we have the specular reflection. And it's called specular because of the Latin word for mirror, which is speculum. So it's a mirror-like reflection. And most materials are a combination of this specular reflection and diffuse reflection. So the highlight compared to the halftone. Halftone are, or halftones are diffuse reflection. There is, however, a term that's useful to use for the lightest halftones, and that is center light. That's the area of a form that's pointing most directly to the light source, to the light direction. So the yellow line here is the light direction. If you think of that as a needle or a pin and you stick the light ray into the form, wherever the form is facing the light, that's the area of the center light. And when you're shading your, your subject in your drawing, you can create a gradient going from that lightest half tone down to the terminator, to the dark half tones. It will always go in that direction in a continuously curving form. So it gives you kind of the start and the end of that gradation. You know where the center light is. And notice center light and highlight are not in the same place. And here I'm sticking a marker onto the specular reflection, and I'm going to move the camera. You can see that the specular reflection is moving with us, moving with the camera, but the center light is staying in the same place. So moving, moving, moving. You see the specular reflection was over here where the red marker is, but now it's traveled over here because we've moved the camera, but the center light is still up there. Some materials have very little or no specular reflection, like very matte materials. So there you only have the center light and then that transition into half tones and there is no specular reflection. But most materials have some amount of specular, even skin, even dry skin. And if you are not aware that there are different things, it might get very confusing when you're trying to draw or paint different materials. I think of the specular reflection almost like having it on a separate layer in digital painting. Even when I draw in pencil or paint in oils, I think of the specular reflection as separate from the modeling of the form with my halftones. By the way, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or note them from your, for yourself and then uh, ask them towards the end. We will have some time to talk about questions. They can be about these technical things 
or about anything else you want to know as well. So ambient light and ambient occlusion. This is super important. And if you don't understand this yet, then I have a suspicion that the next 10 minutes of this lecture will change the way you draw forever. <laughs> it's a really useful thing to create realism in our work. So ambient light is the light that exists in any environment, in any scene, like inside a room. So the light that's separate from or distinguished from your subject and the light, sorry, that was a poor sentence structure. Now uh, it is the ambient light is the light that's in the room, in the environment. And it affects how your subject is being lit. With 3D software, we can generate only the ambient light. And you can see here that the principle is pretty simple. It's basically the more exposed a surface is, the more the ambient light can reach it and illuminate it. But the closer a surface is to another surface, the more they block each other from receiving ambient light and the darker they get. So right down here, where the sphere is touching the floor, that's where we have the least amount of ambient light or the strongest ambient occlusion shadow, which basically means the shadow uh, or the absence of ambient light. So there's no direct light here, no form light, form shadow, anything like that. It's only ambient light that we're looking at. In a room like this, we have light coming in through the windows. And if we zoom out and conceptually think about this, there's going to be a sky outside this building. And a sky is a light source, but it's a very soft, diffuse light source. So the light from the sky is, is shooting light rays in all possible directions. And that light is coming in through the windows here. And it's coming in in a scattered, diffused way. And when it hits the ceiling and the walls and the floor, it's scattering and diffusing and reflecting even further. So it's a very soft, general light. Then we also have direct light here in the background. That is light that's coming directly from the light source, in this case, the sun. It's traveling through the universe, through the window, and hitting the floor. Like, directly. It might go through a few clouds, but it's still, as you can see in the image here, it's very sharp and powerful. Direct light is much, much, much stronger than ambient light. And if you have any ambient occlusion shadows, the direct light will kind of wash those away, as we'll, sh we'll see in a few minutes. So there's that distinction between direct light and ambient light. And the effect of ambient light is generally that it softens and lightens the shadows in your scene. So there's a good example here of a painting by Rembrandt, a self-portrait. You can see some of the direct light coming in through the window and hitting his cheek. Everything else is ambient light. There isn't much of it in this scene because the light is just coming in through a tiny window and probably it's a pretty dark and dingy room. So you can see that all of the front of the face is not black, because black would mean absolutely no light. But the difference between it being black and it being the very little bit of light it has is only due to ambient light. Ambient light is, is what is giving at least a little bit of light we have here. I've painted a little ball to represent the shading on this head. And here's a scale that shows how little ambient light we have, close to 0%. At zero, it would be completely black shadows. They're not black, so we have, I don't know, 5% ambient light. If we increased the intensity of ambient light, then our sphere and our face would look something like that. Kind of subtle, but let me go back and forth a couple times. You see, nothing changes in the form light area where we got direct light, but all the shadows have become 
brighter with more ambient light. So this is a creative tool you can use. You can make a decision of how much or how little ambient light you want to have in your particular image or rendering. Here's another artist, William Bouguereau. He uses virtually like a hundred percent ambient light, very different look, very different atmosphere, very, very soft shadows compared to quite sharp shadows here and very light shadows as well. So a lot of ambient light means bright shadows. When you're studying at the beginning, it makes sense to limit the amount of ambient light you have in your subject, because like if you compare these two images, it will be easier to draw the image on the left than it will be to draw the image on the right, because the shadow shapes are clearly visible when the shadows are dark. So what I've done here is build a shadow box to limit reflected light from the back wall here and just emit light from the room in general. So again, we have very low amount of ambient light. The opposite would be to build a light tent that's used for product photography sometimes. Here you're maximizing ambient light and you get light coming from all possible directions. And the resulting image will be something like that. There's not much light and shadow left here. So there's ambient light and there is ambient occlusion. That's the ambient light shadow in a way. Occlusion means blockage or, or hiding. So these are shadows that are created when two surfaces are close to each other and are blocking the ambient light from reaching those surfaces. You can see it in here where the cylinder is touching the floor. And if I move the light a bit further, you can see that the ambient occlusion is a gradation, a gradient. Inside the cast shadow, it goes lighter and then darker, 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 darker until they touch. And then the form shadow, it also goes darker, 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 darker until they touch. So the closer floor and cylinder are to each other, the darker the occlusion shadow. And it's always a gradual thing. Do not draw occlusion shadows as lines, draw them as gradients, even with contact shadows, like a shoe uh, standing on the floor. It will be a very compressed gradient, but it's still a gradient. And you can see here also the occlusion shadow is visible within the, the shadow family. So form shadow and cast shadow, you won't see much occlusion shadow in the light family. I'll show a better picture of this in a moment. Here again, some 3D uh, magic or useful, useful uh, stuff that the 3D render can give us. On the left, we have all modeling factors, all light effects. That's what nature looks like pretty much, trying to simulate what happens in the real world. And on the right, we are isolating only the ambient occlusion. So you can see it's based on proximity, how close two surfaces are to each other. If I push back this shield here to create more distance between the shield and the sphere, you can see how the occlusion is getting a little bit lighter and it's also getting softer. And you see the occlusion shadow within the cast shadow in the left image. If I remove that, occlusion shadow, it looks very strange. And this is a funny thing with all these modeling factors, but especially ambient occlusion. If you don't know about these things, you're probably not going to draw, put them into your drawings, especially when you're drawing from imagination and to some extent also when you're drawing from observation. But so if I don't know about ambient occlusion, I might draw the scene on the left this way. That, that you're looking at it or the way you're looking at it right now. It's wrong. <laughs> it is much better when I have the ambient occlusion. I get visual separation or spatial separation between that shield shape and the sphere. 
if I increase the distance further, you can see the occluded shadow getting even lighter and even softer. So that's the principle. The closer that two surfaces are to each other, the darker and sharper the occlusion shadow becomes. And inversely, the further away they are, the lighter and softer the shadow becomes. Oh my, I forgot to turn on the video feed. Sorry about that. And I think, well, let's see. <laughs> this is the first time I'm using that feature. So we got shadow family and light family. And I mentioned before that we see the occlusion shadow mostly in this inside the shadow family. If we go back here, shadow family is the cast shadow, sorry, form shadow and the cast shadow. And on the right image, there is occlusion shadow to the left of where the sphere is touching the floor. But in the final render on the, on the left side, in that area, there is no occlusion shadow visible because the direct light that's hitting the floor there is so much stronger than the ambient occlusion shadow. So use your occlusion shadows inside the shadow family. Here's something fun I did. And these are Bark drawings from Charles Bark's drawing course. If you look at the shadow here, there is no ambient occlusion at the moment. And then I added ambient occlusion. And you see how much more of a sense of form we have. Same in this image. Oh, our slide. In there is the ambient occlusion. Same in this image. No ambient occlusion. And then with ambient occlusion. So it is something, it's a tool you can use to show form inside of your shadows. And it is happening all around you in nature. Maybe you can look around and find an occlusion shadow right now. Back to the sphere. The last of the modeling factors is the penumbra. And that is the softness around the cast shadow. The principle there is pretty simple. The closer the cast shadow is to the terminator shape that projected the cast shadow, the sharper the penumbra. If the light has to travel a further distance from the object, the penumbra will get softer. Same thing here. Close to that stick, we get a sharp cast shadow and it progressively gets softer until the tip here where it is at its softest. The overall softness depends a lot on the type of light um, that is shining on the object, whether that's sunlight, in that case it stays a bit sharper, or something like a softbox that's close to the subject. But generally that's the, the principle. If you're getting closer, it's sharper. If you're getting further away, it's softer. All right, let's run through all of them again. There is form light, form shadow. Separating the two is the country border of the terminator, which projects down onto the floor and the cast shadow. Then inside the form shadow, we have reflected light, which creates the core shadow. And inside the form light, we have the half tones, the specular reflection and the center light. Then there's ambient light and ambient occlusion and the penumbra. So what can you do with all that information? You can do fun stuff like this. So make a little simple model out of stuff you have at home sticks and rags and paper towels and stuff like that. And you can turn that into a pretty convincing rendering of something from imagination. If you understand the principles of light, you can, you have freedom, you have control, you're a more capable creator. These are all uh, student works from the shading course that I mentioned before. I like this one a lot. 
like an egg battlefield that then the artist has turned into a crashed spaceship, I believe, with the pilot making a fire trying to survive. So you can change the time of day, you can change the scale by using reference images and not being a slave of the reference, but using them creatively through the power of your understanding. Or this one, paper towel, mouse, which is pretty cute. Um, in the shading course, I also take some useful techniques from visual effects. So in a movie, the scene might look like this, but on set, it actually looked like that. So a lot of green screen, a lot of replacements have been made, but the final image is very convincing because it is coherent in itself. All of those modeling factors or light effects make sense with each other. And one tool that visual effects artists use are light probes. We got a specular probe and a diffuse probe. We can use that too as painters and illustrators and concept artists. Whether you're working from observation or imagination, having a light probe gives you a kind of map so you know where the light is coming from and what the quality of that light is. Here, an example of shading from imagination and shading an object with different local values in a way that's convincing. I also talk a little bit about form and structure in my course, which is really important to be able to conceptualize surfaces like that. Form is kind of one half of the equation and light and light logic and physics is the other half. And you can do things like this, shading, simple creatures from imagination. I love talking about tonal values as well and how to organize the complexity and that, that exists in nature when you're drawing a human figure or pretty much anything in nature. There are an infinite amount of different shades of light and dark. And if you have a strategy for organizing them, you will be much more confident and also competent in, in translating what you're seeing into an image that, that makes sense and is aesthetically pleasing. This is called value grouping. And there are a couple different ways of doing it. And here, building a maquette as a lighting reference or working from imagination. So the last few images were uh, part or were examples of student work from my online course, which is called the shading course. And it's really like I mentioned it here for two reasons. And one is that this is the main thing I'm working on. Uh, last two, three years, and it's the main source of joy for me. And I think also for, for several students that are in the community that has grown around the course. We have a Discord server as well that has a really good atmosphere. And um, let's see how to <laughs> sequence. So. The course is open all year round and you can take it on your own if you want. It consists of video lessons with information like what we've done today, but also uh, as importantly, or maybe more importantly, there are about 30 different assignments that you can do to teach yourself how to use these skills and apply them in your work. So you can do the course at your own time uh, whenever you want. And you don't need to interact with anyone, but I think it's much smarter and much more fun to do it in the community. And we started, well, I say it differently. Um, every week I give feedback. So most of the year, uh, every Wednesday, I'm doing a Zoom session and I look at what's been posted on Discord and do paintovers and give feedback. It's a great way 
a really enjoyable way to hang out and spend time together as well. And then once or twice a year, I do a term where we go through the course together. Um, it's eight modules, so eight weeks. We all start together and then do module one, and then review module one, and then go week by week. We just started a, the summer term two days ago. So if anyone here would like to join us, you can do that for, I think, the next week or so. And Grant and I have figured out or, or put together two really cool things. One is that you can get 25% off the course with the code art workhouse, all one word. And then Grant, I think, is going to share a link in the chat here. And for every person who joins the course through that link, 20% of the revenue are going to flow right back into the art workhouse community. So I think that's really nice. So that is the official part of the presentation. Let's see, we are 50 minutes into it. We can do two things now. I can take questions and, and chat about anything you feel like. And or I can share a bit of my background, my story, different people I studied with. I'm going to take my cue from you guys. See what you prefer. Yeah, that, that was a ton of awesome information in a very short span of time. <laughs> I appreciate Thank that, you. man. That was that was a whirlwind. That's that's one of those like watch through it a couple time, times kind of things. Um, just yeah. real quick, since it was just mentioned, I've put links in the where to go resources chat. It's above us. Um, so those are the sort of like artwork house affiliate links, and everything that comes from those is just getting rolled back into the server. So that'll be used for things like resources. Uh, hosting costs, art, art like artist grants, stuff like that. It's all just kind of getting rolled back in. So if you're interested, that's a place that you can check it out. Um, and then, yeah, I think Gerda had a question here. So I'll just go ahead and read it out. Uh, they asked, how do you build up with this knowledge? It's referring to the um, the values that you were talking about. So what do you perfect or what do you personally start with? Or do you have everything in mind? Or do you work from separate light sources and shadows? Basically, I think kind of asking, like, how do you approach all of these sort of 12 different groups and trying to get them to cohere in a way that's like repeatable. Does that make sense? Yeah, I wish I could answer that question in one or two sentences, but I guess my answer to that is the course. <laughs> um, but if you Google how to draw, uh, there is a kind of walk through. This is very like traditional. If you're doing a drawing from observation, I explain the different stages here. And building a drawing in a repeatable, like systematic way. That for me has worked very well. And when I have a commission or a job to do, like doing a portrait, then I often go to that method because I know it works. It's like, that's my craft. And yeah, I guess there are infinite number of ways of doing that. And you ultimately will find your own way. And hopefully not just one way, but you will keep experimenting and breaking that process and putting it together backwards and, and finding something new. Yeah. If there's a, a, a specification of that question, I'm happy to go deeper. To sort of add to that too, I know a lot of digital artists will actually separate it on different layers because that's one of the like mm -hmm. benefits of digital art is you you can actually have tr either transparent layers on top or um, layers with different blend modes and stuff. So it is actually possible with digital art to separate your light sources into almost like just different layers. Um, so I know some people like to do that as well. Just something to experiment with. Uh, let's see here. Nanochan asks a uh, question. How do you get the right values for each one of those areas for any like specific lighting scene? Even when I memorized all the light and shadow parts, my values still made it look very unprofessional. So I think they're asking about the actual like, you know, what specific value are you using or what would you say to that? There's no one answer. I think it's 
it's a continuous process of reassessing and refining and rebalancing. And there's, for me, the best way to train your mind to develop an intuitive sense of what is right is to work from nature. The more exposure you have to really looking, and then also like there are two parts to that. One is sensitivity and one is control. Sensitivity of looking and perceiving with, with subtlety, and then also the control part, which is on your drawing, being able to control your pencil, to push just the right amount, <laughs> the pressure, to get exactly the tone you want, um, to create a hole that works. Makes sense. I can add a little bit to uh, NanoChan. I've seen a bunch of your work in the server, so I know you're doing mostly like imaginative stuff. Um, and so you'll run into that a lot where, you know, a lot of this is, is drawing from life, like from observation, right? So you have the sort of, I, I guess I view it as like, you have the answers in front of you, right? You, like you have nature's cheat sheet sheet in front of you and you're just trying to copy it. When working imaginatively, like that's where reference comes in and is super important. So using kind of the like maquettes, like Dorian had showed throughout the, um, the video where it, it was different, like, yeah, can you pull that slide? Yeah, either literal maquettes like this. This is something that was done. Uh, I know James Gurney writes about this a lot. Um, or alternately, like making those kind of paper maquettes or different things like that. That can be a way to get that uh, like a, a semblance of that cheat sheet for your for your values. Um, and yeah, Blender is another great way to do that. So that's that's what I use Blender for imaginative is a, stuff. Is I'll it's do an incredible tool. Yep, rough blockins. Um, it's and that, so no, go ahead. Fun. Yeah. If you're trying to solve a lighting problem, teach yourself Blender. It takes a couple of days. There's some really good tutorials on YouTube. It's free open source program and you can build something even with like, it's almost like Lego with cubes and spheres. You can pop something together and then have a light source or multiple light sources, move them around, see what the shadows do. That'll be good enough to draw. If you're drawing something that doesn't exist in the real world. 100%. And I would say, especially if you're digging into Blender, uh, I wouldn't even bother trying to learn the modeling right off the bat personally. I would learn how to spawn in primitives. Mm. And then you can grab stuff off of like Sketchfab has literally hundreds of thousands of downloadable models. So you can get something close to what you want, pop it in. And basically, all you'll need to know is how to set up the lights. It's, it's yeah. not as intimidating as it sounds. Yeah, agreed. So a few different options for that, I guess. Um, yeah, I wanted to just point something out while we wait and see if there's any other kind of questions that come through. I really found it interesting how you mentioned that the Terminator is what creates the cast shadow. Um, like I've I've looked into all this stuff before, and um, I was originally like classically trained as well in charcoal. I, that for some reason never clicked. I don't know why that never clicked, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to point it out. Because, yeah, that makes total sense. I would never thought of it that way, but that makes it much easier to calculate. Yes, and <laughs> that said, for me, this is one of the hardest things. And I'm not very good at perspective. Uh, I can remember, uh, recommend drawabox.com for anyone. Probably most of you are familiar with that. I think it's very good to have some facility in drawing and constructing perspective. But with complex objects and cast shadows that's another place where i will go to 3d and you know let blender calculate the shadow of one monkey head on the top like casting on top of another monkey head i'm not going to plot that out in perspective or i'll do it in uh like with paper towels or some simple way like this that makes total sense yeah i think just reference and maquettes in general are one of the biggest things that I see that is really underutilized, uh, like in the like early to mid level art range. Because if you look at a lot of the top illustrators, yeah. they'll use them heavily, heavily, heavily. And it's just one of those things that like it doesn't end up making it on social media that much because it it doesn't feel all that interesting. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a huge part of the process. So, yeah, agreed. Right on. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, if you want to walk us through a little bit of your kind of story here, I'm not seeing any other questions come through at the moment. I think everybody's just kind of processing the wealth of information you've given us here. Latins. Yeah. 
Okay, sure. Let's relax a bit. So here's me at age five on top of a pony <laughs> in Switzerland, where I grew up. I was born in Austria, but moved to Switzerland when I was three. Uh, pretty rough separation my parents went through. Uh, I'm actually going to meet my dad for the third time in my life. I'm 37 now. Um, next week on Monday. Oh, wow. That's and insane. A few days together. Yeah. But anyway, we don't have to go there. I tend to, to go too deep too quickly. Um, <laughs> so like most of you, I was doodling as a kid. And I think it's really innocent and just fun. And I was drawing police cars and monsters and stuff like that. And when I was maybe 13, I, oh, this one first. Um, also in my teens, I got into breakdancing and hip hop culture and graffiti. So I was trying to make cool looking letter designs. Got arrested once in Switzerland for doing graffiti on a legal, a legal wall. It was a building that was going to be torn down. We all knew it is okay to spray paint on it. But of course the police didn't know. So, <laughs> and of course it is much like, it's no fun to go do graffiti during the day. So my friend and me went at night and well, we got pinned down by cops and, and interrogated like separated and interrogated at the police station. And then a couple of days later, they found out that actually, yes, it's fine. It is legal there. And they even gave us back the cans. I went to bring, sorry, I went to the police station to pick up the cans that they had confiscated. And the guy that was responsible wasn't there. So a couple of days later, he drove over to my house in the police car and gave me back my cans. I think that only happens in Switzerland. <laughs> um, also in my teens, my dad or stepdad uh, brought home uh, our first computer. And there was Microsoft Paint, which I don't have any original artwork from that time, but I started by literally by painting pixels in Microsoft Paint. And shortly after I got into Photoshop and I just pressed every single button in that program, tried all the filters <laughs> and just to see what happens and tried them in different orders and just explored. And I was part of a group at the local youth center that organized concerts. And one of my jobs, besides cleaning up at four in the morning after the events, and one of my jobs was to create the posters and flyers for those events. And that was the first time that my work was like in public on the walls of the city. I really didn't do graffiti uh, outside my sketchbook other than that one time mostly. Um, but this was a legal way to have my work like in the city. And I also realized how limited I was with my drawing abilities. So on the 1st of January, 2004, I made a new year's resolution to take drawing seriously and draw every day for a year. And I decided to number my drawings. And this is the first page. So you see number one up here, number three. And at the end of January, I was at drawing number 78 and drawing my mom. And I struggled quite a lot especially with perspective. I just could not figure out how to turn these Loomis heads. Uh, but I kept trying and I kept struggling and kept trying. And every once in a while, I would do a drawing that surprised me. So on the left is my drawing, on the right is the reference. I did something that I didn't think I was capable of doing. And I think that kept me going for the next couple months of plateau slash struggle, <laughs> frustration again. And then I found this image, I came across this image online and it just blew my mind. I think this is much more common nowadays, but back then there was nothing like that around. And I just couldn't believe 
my eyes. I couldn't believe that someone had painted this thing that looked as real as the sculpture next to it. I had already been looking for a school to learn how to draw and paint, like to learn the craft. And almost everywhere I went, like I went to Paris, to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and different places in Switzerland. And all the, the public schools, universities had shifted to abstract art, um, conceptual art, not in the sense of concept art, but conceptual, like about the idea. And there was no more craft training. But then I found this and I found out that this was done at a school called Angel Academy in Florence. And I went to visit and really felt at home. I, I liked the people. It was a fairly small school. I don't know how it is now. I haven't been back and they've moved twice and they changed some of the instructors. So check it out before you decide to go there if, if that's interesting to you. But for me back then, it was just a perfect fit. And I was lucky too in that we had a really good uh, crop of students, like a good vintage. There's some of my classmates from there are now uh, successful, famous artists. We all started together back there and through the regular academic training, copying drawings at the beginning. So my drawing on the right, the reference on the left. And with these, it just takes as long as it takes to get it quote unquote perfect. And it's not you who decides when you're done, it's your instructor. <laughs> so that led to some tears and frustration on the part of other students. For me, somehow I never, I never got to that. Like, there were people who pleaded for like, please let me finally pass on to the next project. But for me, the feedback I got was always about seeing more. And the instructor would come by and tell me, hey, did you notice on this little piece, there's a light that's catching or a plane that's catching the light in just such a way. And I hadn't noticed before. And when he pointed it out, I, I did. And then it was exciting for me to put that new observation into the drawing. So I was one of the slower students because of that. And again, this drawing took four, no, three months, three months of work. This one as well. But in that time and in that like going into drawing and into the visual system, into observation so deeply, mm. It's, it's an experience that's there now. Like I've expanded my range. I've gone really far and I don't need to go that far now every time I make a drawing, but I know what that feels like to be there. And I can do it in different parts of an image. For example, I can push the realism or like the, the density of information very high if I want to. And then changing here from charcoal to oil paint learning the basics of mixing paint and layering paint and trying times and different pigments and all that, which was fun too. And doing figure work from life models. So this was my, my technical foundation. I was there for four years and very deeply immersed. I was very shy and kind of socially anxious. Like I remember walking in the street to Florence and someone coming towards me on the same sidewalk, I would often cross the street just not to have to endure that, that tension of, of social interaction or non-interaction. I don't know. Like I had to force myself to go to parties and different events. That was not my comfort zone at all. Uh, it's gotten much, much better. Uh, over time, I've done a lot of different things, workshops and therapy and, and stuff. And I'm much more comfortable now. Anyway, a little detour. So when I graduated <laughs> in, at Flor from Florence, what I really wanted to do is be an apprentice and learn how to deal with galleries, how to interact with 
collectors, how to run a studio, basically, which we didn't learn. We just learned the, well, not just, but we just learned the technical aspect of drawing and painting, but not the professional aspect. So I was looking for masters who were taking on apprentices, and it was quite challenging. And in the same time, I found out about a new school that was starting called the Art Department. And it was one of the very first schools doing art instruction online, but they also had studios on site. The school no longer exists, um, but they basically invited me to teach what I had learned in Florence in exchange for a scholarship. Well, they paid me for my teaching as well, so I could pay rent and they allowed me to study at the, at the school. And the course was entertainment design. I had been doing digital art in the evenings and weekends because I didn't have a social life. <laughs> so I was just drawing, painting and learning about different things. Um, and I was interested in games and film and working from imagination. So that's a, a piece that started traditionally, but then I finished digitally. And here's a very early ZBrush version two or something, um, digital sculpture. And at the art department, I all of a sudden had a lot of different teachers who were working in the entertainment industry, uh, editorial, illustration, animation. We worked with some very high level, like seasoned pros. And I learned a lot about design and met great people. My friendship with Marshall Vandruff is from that time. Um, sadly, that school collapsed, <laughs> um, but I still really enjoyed my time there and learned a lot. Did some concept art stuff, kind of silly, and you know, all the, the weapon war destruction, it's not my cup of tea, but I learned skills. After the art department collapsed, I went back to like chasing after finding someone or multiple people to spend some time with and learn the ropes about being a professional artist, what that looks like. And I stayed with each of these three people for several months and kind of living with them, working with them. First one was Christopher Pugliese in Hoboken, New Jersey. He paints these large multi-figure compositions. And I was with him for a couple of months and my job was to basically give the first coat of paint on these figures here. So we had a super rough underpainting, like what's left up here. And Chris was still working on the small study. And my job was to take the information from the small study and apply it to the big study. And then at the end of the day, he would go over my work and correct my mistakes. And it was just a, a great setup. And we had a lot of fun with the, the photo shoots. And uh, that's in the next image. This one is one of his, his final pieces. That's the same size as this one. Yeah, here's a photo shoot moment. <laughs> and then Ted Seth Jacobs uh, lives in France, or he lived in France when I was there. He had just turned uh, 85. And if we talk about seeing more and putting more like a resolution of information density into your artwork, this guy it goes further than most. Incredible. Uh, just richness and complexity in his work. He also painted his whole house, like all the ceilings and walls and floor. There's a, a fish pond here in the entrance hall of his house, painted on the floor. Uh, just a true artist and super interesting and, and warm man. And then Patrick Devonas, who funnily just called me now. <laughs> We're going to meet tonight and record a, a podcast, the two of us, that we're hopefully starting. The, the second episode, we'll see how it goes. He is an amazing person, super generous, 
knows so much. Uh, he's a sculptor as well as a painter. He works on imagination quite a lot. Uh, he's building this monument right now in his garden for a young girl that was killed during the witch hunt years in Europe. And he paints these giant, ambitious, complex, beautiful compositions. There's a nice short documentary on his website. If you look for Patrick Devonas, you'll find his site. So I hope some of these images are fueling your inspiration tanks. Yeah, that's wild. It's got definitely mm. some like Frazetta vibes with the colors and the anatomy and stuff. Yeah. And then the most recent chapter was in Spain, where I was at Barcelona Academy of Art. And my job there was to be a director of the digital art and design department where I got to combine this entertainment design uh, stuff and digital painting and all of that with the traditional academic, like old school classical training. So here are the students working on digital cast paintings. This was done in Photoshop, same kind of process and same, same, um, Kind of mental approach to seeing more and putting more into your work, but just a different medium. Here, a pair, the life painting, also in Photoshop. And that maquette was from a, this was super fun. We made a small book project where we created little creatures that could live in the academy, like this guy stealing like a goblin stealing paint and eating it or this gentleman collecting bits of charcoal that students left on the floor and put it into a little book form we also made a video game prototype together that was the most stressful <laughs> uh, term <laughs> that i've ever had but super fun we used blender and unity create a little interactive uh, world. And now I am like when the pandemic came, I moved back to Switzerland after a while. And I'm in the mountains in a town with 200 people. Uh, Patrick is here, like I moved here because of him. Um, and I'm doing um, private commissions, portraits, and just art projects of all I think types and shapes. And I'm doing the shading course, which has really been a wonderful, also a wonderful way to have that community interaction. That's it, I think. Ah. Does anyone have questions about the journey or anything else before we close? We'll leave it open for a second here for people to kind of take a look at. But yeah, that's wild, man. That's you've been all over. That's super cool. I think I it's have, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, no. <laughs> I think it's pretty wild, like that you had a chance to apprentice. Like that's uh that's like old masters style apprenticeship, right? Where you're doing the color block ins for the for the bigger artists. That's super cool. That's a very unique experience. Yeah, with Chris, it was most like that. With Ted, it was more, I think it was a workshop that he was teaching. And yeah, we would just spend a lot of time talking. Um, and like he gave me life advice and art advice. And with Patrick, it also wasn't so much that I was a studio assistant or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Although I would have liked to, but for him, like he keeps saying that anything he does, I can do too. And I like need to realize how, <laughs> like what I, what I'm not realizing about myself and that we're totally on even level, which for me is like, no, man, you've been painting so much longer than me and so much more. Um, but that's Patrick, but I'm just. Just being around him and, and seeing how he lives and works. I have learned a lot. Yeah, makes sense. 
Well, I think we'll go ahead and call it there. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us. I, I massively appreciate you being willing to swing by and uh, it was super, super interesting. I, I'm going to have to go back through some of that um, light and shadow stuff because it's been a while since I've really dug into that and I definitely learned some stuff. So I really appreciate you putting everything yeah. together for us. My pleasure. I really enjoyed this. And maybe one thing to leave you with, like all of you, um, if you want something, just go for it. Do it. Find a way. I like it. Powerful words. Well, thanks so much, man. We'll go ahead and call it here. And uh, yeah, I'm thanks sure I'll see me. you all around. Thanks so much for to everybody for hanging out. And uh, a special shout out to Styx for kind of helping arrange this. Uh, appreciate it, Styx, yes. for making that connection. That's it for this month. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify if you enjoyed this episode and share it with a friend if you know someone who may find this information useful. For more resources or for more information about the workhouse, hop on over to artworkhouse.org where you'll be able to join our lively moderated community and where you can find tons of free resources like reference photos, other sessions, recordings, and job postings for artists who want to further their career or their skills. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next month.